that's okay. I think it's all right now. Um, all right. So tonight, I just want to get a little bit of housekeeping out of the way. So what we're going to do is this is going to be really interactive. We want to do lots of questions. We're going to definitely have a Q&A at the end of the program. But if you guys have something as we're speaking and you want to ask any questions, we'll try to, to answer them as we go as well. So um, we're going to go for hopefully about an hour today. It depends on how many Q and how many questions that we do. Um, and the focus is really going to be on entrepreneurship. So obviously, my background is as, as an entrepreneur. I don't have a background as a teacher. I did not go to teacher's college or anything like that. I have started Expat International School because I saw that there was a massive need for it in the marketplace. What ends up happening a lot of times with international schools and, and international families is that it is a, a family moves overseas, for example, and the child just ends up getting picked up and put into a new school. They don't know anybody. It can be a little bit overwhelming. But as soon as they start to find their feet and they start to get comfortable with things, the family often moves. They end up going on to the next country or the next city. Mom gets a job overseas. Dad gets a job overseas. And they move to the next one. And most expat families end up doing this two, three, four times during their careers. Now. I've lived in nine different countries. If I had kids who were going through schools and they had to change that many times, they'd probably kill me. But with Expat International School, what we're able to do is offer a program that is 100% online so they can have friends and make friends when they join the program and then they don't have to say goodbye. We actually encourage um, friendship throughout so they have opportunities to talk and bond with one another. They have a chance to socialize and discuss lots of different ideas, which is something we'll be talking about tonight. But there's many reasons that this needed to be done. And, and I came into this as an entrepreneur. Um, the other thing that you will also notice is with the school systems in the world right now, they'll usually just take some type of a program from back home, say the British school model or the French school model or the German school model, and they'll move it to an international setting. So what ends up happening is if you don't like that type of schooling from back home and you put your child into it, it's going to be exactly the same, except there's going to be a twenty, twenty-five, thirty thousand dollar $30,000 price tag now attached to it. So for that, you might as well stay home, to be completely frank, if that's all you're going to get. With our program, it's completely interactive. There is, we look at education very differently. We both have a very different background to education. So these are a lot of reasons why I wanted to get into this as an entrepreneur. Michael, maybe you can start us off by talking about some of the reasons or some of the ways, I suppose, that we are different and we actually showcase entrepreneurship on a daily basis, let's say. Sure. Um, I'll focus on kind of three big buckets, and then we can dig into each of the three big buckets later on. Um, but first, John Taylor Gatto, New York State Teacher of the Year, described in his acceptance speech, speech that conventional education is 12 years of training in how to be passive and how to be dependent. Um, he wrote this in an essay called Seven Lessons School Teacher. I highly recommend everybody read it. He goes through that the notion that regardless of the curriculum at a school, the medium is the message. And the message is wait to do what you're told. Um, wait for others for approval of who you are. And basically, do not think for yourself and do not take action on your own. You know, despite this training in how to be passive and dependent, um, many people do go through the system and do, in fact, become entrepreneurs. But I think on net, it stifles the impulse that young people have to take initiative, create value, do real world things. And not coincidentally, there is a literature on how many entrepreneurs hated school and often left it. Famously, Richard Branson is a high school dropout. John Mackey, Bill Gates, Steve Jobs and many others are college dropouts. The notion to sit down and do as you're told is fundamentally different from the notion of take initiative now to get stuff done. And so our school is basically designed to support student initiative and independent thinking. It's baked into everything we do, having students own their own education and be responsible and make commitments and so forth. So that's bucket one is 
fundamental reversal of the passivity and dependence towards initiative and responsibility. Step two, I'll spend the least time on. Um, I'm fairly familiar with a lot of entrepreneurial curricula. It's a huge world. We have a course on personal finance and startup finance. And um, you know, I've also used various entrepreneurial curricula. There are many different dimensions. They're valuable and interesting. And rather than say, this is the one right way, we want different aspects of student entrepreneurial uh, understanding to be informed by many different frameworks and curricula. Not one right way, it's uh, real entrepreneurs learn in lots of different ways all over the place. Um, and then bucket number three is fundamental to our program is one-on-one -on -one mentoring and student-driven projects with the goal of ideally world-class or adult-class, adult-level performance by 18 including either an entrepreneurial initiative or a creative professional product. And that is, I think, in some ways, an especially interesting bucket, so to speak. Uh, and I look forward to uh, going back and forth with you, Mikel, on examples of student projects and mentoring. Yeah, absolutely. So why don't we start by talking about maybe some of your previous students, because I think that having some examples of what we're talking about and the types of projects that the kids have done, I think is really illustrative of the entire project. Absolutely. Um, and of course, there is a John Stossel video of a previous school, which includes some of these. So you might want to link to that. Um, I'll give I've been doing this current version about 10 years. And in this version, I have, for instance, had a student who was a website, created the website for an American Idol finalist. It was his official celebrity website for about a year, and then he fired my student, which was a painful but good experience. There's nothing like actually being responsible for a real world celebrity website and then eventually getting fired uh, because he thought you weren't the best. Great experience. Another example, I had a student write articles for Atlas Obscura, a website with a million monthly page views. And that one, you know, writing articles is in some ways not an entrepreneur, but he was taking initiative to achieve adult level performance. It was edited by a former Atlantic Monthly editor. Uh, and so he, on his own initiative with the support of me as mentor, was published in a serious publication. Another example, I had a student actually do training videos for Kaiser Permanente. Uh, healthcare chain based in California. So many students like video um, rather than just video because the student likes it. Let's actually have students get paid for doing professional level work as a student. Another example, I had a student who was a concert promoter as a sophomore. He was booking bands, booking venues, selling tickets, made about 8,000 bucks. As a senior, he created a three-day music festival, bands from around the world, $80,000 budget. You know, pretty substantial for an 18 year old kid. I've had kids work as day traders, kids make money in photography, kids create software companies and games, kids write novels. So the idea is to mentor students to do real world achievements uh, by the time they're 18, starting often with little projects and plenty of failures when they're 11, 12, 13. Well, I think that you bring up a very interesting point right at the end, the piece about failures. So in traditional school, failure is really looked down on, and actually it has kind of a negative connotation around it. But actually failure is one of the greatest things that you can do as an entrepreneur. If you start failing and fail often and fail fast, at the very beginning, in a safe environment, oh my goodness, you will be able to make so much progress. Now. If you have to go through this and start failing when you're 40 years old and you have millions of dollars on the line, you know, the, the stakes are a lot higher. I would much rather to have our kids starting doing it at 13, 14, 15 years old, where they're still in a relative safety nest and get to make mistakes and then discuss them afterwards with their mentor, with the teachers, with their parents, with the faculty, and of course, with the other kids. I think that this is an excellent learning opportunity. So it often doesn't have to be the kids themselves who are making mistakes or failing or, or going through these types of things. It can actually be others in the classroom and it's a fantastic opportunity to learn. Absolutely. And, and just to talk about a particular dimension of this, first of all, most people only really learn through experience. So you can provide them with whatever lectures and curriculum and tests and whatever 
but they only learn through real experience. And in particular, with respect to student projects, many of them start with grandiose, completely unrealistic projects. And we can say, okay, uh, what are you going to achieve next week? You know, use a smart goals framework perhaps, or try to talk them into more manageable pieces. But until they say, oh yeah, I'm gonna do this and this and this and this. Okay, and what are you gonna get done next week? And of course, very often they only get a small fraction of what they had claimed to be they're going to get done. And bit by bit, they see that getting stuff done in the real world is much harder than dreaming about cool projects. And that process alone, you know, after they've, by means of their own behavior, demonstrated that perhaps they had, uh, you know, said they were going to do more than they can actually get done, they gradually learn to become much more realistic in their goals. So maybe after a year or two of this uh, grandiosity, they take a more bite-sized chunk. I'll actually give you a, a real-world example of um, one case where I had a young uh, woman who was interested in saving the Lemurs of Madagascar. So it was a nonprofit rather than a for-profit, but she, they're in danger of going extinct, so she wrote scientists, learned all about them, tried to raise money and everything, and after a year she realized this was way too big a project, she could never have an impact, and so, so she uh, decided to change projects. Her second year, she decided to distribute tampons to homeless women here in Austin. Much smaller project. She was actually able to raise money, you know, distribute tampons, and it was kind of a small, modest project, but she succeeded. She had this sense of, this is something that I can do. And then her third year, she decided to become uh, a midwife's assistant and actually learned uh, midwifery as her project and graduated early and went on to uh, practice as a midwife for a while. So not grandiose entrepreneurship, but, and clearly her, her passion was caring, whether it's the Lemurs or the homeless women or midwifery, but she had to go through this process of trying this, trying that, and you know, like Goldilocks, uh, too big, too small, just right. Uh, but that experience put her in a position where many students don't, don't get to be until they're 22, 23, 24. Yeah, if that if they get an opportunity at all like that to go through things. Um, I think that's really important because as children learn from their mistakes and go through these types of things and get feedback and are able to discuss these types of things, the momentum that they're going to be able to gain from that is huge. So we're going to be talking today, um, you know, about the hard skills that the kids will learn. We're going to be talking about soft skills that they're going to be learning. But I think that starting with these types of things, like the mentality of an entrepreneur is very valuable because it's not something that a lot of people know and understand. And, and I don't blame people, you know, if you've never been an entrepreneur, if you've never gone down this path as a parent, well, then how are you expected to teach your kids. If you don't know, how are you going to teach it? So I think it's important to have the kids surrounded by people that they want to model. Modeling is extremely, not just important, but effective as well. So having the school start by entrepreneurs and a lot of our faculty are entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs as well. Maybe that's actually a good segue, Michael, to talk to, about some of our faculty and the things that they've done. No, absolutely. And, and actually, I, I want to connect it to kind of real world coaching because the faculty, so every student meets one-on-one -on -one with a mentor 20 to 30 minutes a week. And that mentorship relation is key. And it's really essential that our guides, we call them guides, uh, have some kind of relevant real world experience in order to mentor students effectively. Um, so to give you an example from today, I actually just had a conversation with the mentor today. Uh, he had a student who, made all sorts of claims about the business the student wanted to create, but the student was not actually following through. And one of the conversations, a weekly conversation that's been going on now for six months with this student was in life, there are trade-offs. In order to be responsible and actually get some things done, maybe you might have to change other aspects of your life. And if you don't make real commitments in terms of you know, time and focus, you're not actually going to get things done. And of course, anybody who's actually created a business, and this man had created a couple of successful CrossFit gyms, knows focus and responsibility and follow through are absolutely essential. And as a consequence, his mentorship was on how to get the, his mentee 
to be serious about trade-offs, responsibility, and accountability, because without those sorts of fundamental attitudes and behaviors, nothing matters. Um, we've also had uh, faculty who themselves have started other kinds of businesses, faculty who have worked in our program, uh, mentoring students on these businesses. And in general, I really care more about, on the one hand, academic expertise, you know, math or um, being able to write effectively or whatever, plus some kind of real world experience where they've had to do things. I actually think a huge problem with education is that most educators or many, not all, but many educators went to school for K-12, went to school for university, were trained as teachers, go back to the classroom and have never had to start a business or even work professionally. Um, so even if somebody say was an editor for a few years for a, a magazine, they may not have started the magazine, but they had deadlines and they had to be accountable to customers and they had to be accountable to bosses. And the fundamental structure of business gives a reality-based focus that I think academia on its own is almost completely lacking. Well said, well said. Shall we get into some of the skills, the hard skills, the soft skills that things go through? Maybe we can use it as an example when you talk about uh, you know, a typical day and how the curriculum looks throughout the year and highlight some of the ways that we are, are showcasing these. Absolutely. So I, I describe our program, I'll start with the end in mind and then back up, as especially suited to entrepreneurial children, creative children, and intellectual children. On the creative children, um, something that I would say distinctive is we're very focused on creative professional success. That is being able to make a living as a creative as opposed to art for art's sake. So even with our creatives, in a sense, we're cultivating them to be entrepreneurs. And maybe our more intellectual children who do love uh, intellectual work for its own sake, there's also a focus on, and how can you actually cash this out as an entrepreneur? So whether they're explicitly entrepreneurs, and we do have some students who are just rock star entrepreneurs, or whether they're more of a creative or intellectual, we want, we want them to have this real world focus. Going to the next step, um, because most parents and most students care also about college admissions, while we want to prepare students at the end of the day for success at 18 as an entrepreneur or creative professional, we also want to prepare them for um, admissions and success at the college of their choice. So how do we square that particular circle? Our college admission strategy consists of have great SAT scores, be able to demonstrate you can pass some college level courses before you go on to college, and then finally to have a great project. And what that does is often students who are entrepreneurs or creators find they get into high school and if they have three, four hours of homework a night, they don't have time for their projects, but we bake into the college admissions strategy time to do serious work on a project, which is very distinctive. And provided students have great SAT scores and have demonstrated the ability to pass college courses, the great project is actually a huge asset in the college admissions project. Colleges want students who can get things done. And if you want to look at the naked self-interest of, say, good liberal arts colleges, they want people who later to go on to make money and donate money. So if you have a kid who's making money at 18 while, by the way, being capable academically, that's interesting to colleges. Backing down to the program itself, go through a typical day. Uh, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m., Monday through Friday, start with community where we work together, pods of 15 to 1 or fewer, so small groups of students, and we begin our day simply by letting them to connect socially. So for the first few minutes, especially in a virtual program, it's good to let them be kids together, build relationships, laugh, joke, current events, books, games, movies, a little bit of hanging out is actually legitimate, especially virtually. Then we go into personal growth. This is really important. Here it's still conversational and informal, but we talk about, you know, how do you set goals? How do you uh, learn from your mistakes? How do you deal with anger? You know, how do you work effectively with other people? And we open up a conversation where they reflect on basically, I would say, how to be a, a, 
a functional adult human being. Turns out it's complicated to be an adult human being, and we work with them to think through what they have to change in themselves to really be effective. We take a little break, then Socratic Dialogue, my specialty, I wrote the book on it. We read and discuss complex texts in philosophy, literature, poetry, economics, and so forth, and they learn to think, talk, and argue while uh, improving their SAT verbal scores by means of this practice. And then they also learn to write essays based on clarity of expression. Um, and I make the point to them that it's not about writing essays just for academia. Every adult professional, every entrepreneur will be more effective if they can write a clear email. Just the ability to write a really clear email is a universally valuable characteristic ability. Um, finally, we go on to projects and those projects typically are, you know, the mentor helps them coach something aligned with their interest with the goal of adult level professional expertise by 18. And then depending on their interest, they may have um, math or science or history or foreign languages. We have electives in art, music, technology, philosophy, politics, and economics, PE. So we kind of have a core program that develops the communication skills, provides the mentorship and the project development. And then we have an incredible variety of particular courses they can take. And we're all about personalization. So I'll pause there and uh, see what I maybe should go in more deeply. Well, I think that you can continue on because I think that you are on a very good train here. I think this is really important. I would like you to share with everybody some more of the elective, some of the more exciting things that we wouldn't find somewhere else, possibly things about the programming, about the video editing, and about graphic design and these types of things. I think that those are all sure. really, really important. Sure. So the standard schedule, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday, tends to be more liberal arts. And so that's where they do have the projects, but they also have the Socratic humanities. And then uh, they also may have math and science. But even um, one of our math programs is the personal finance startup finance. One of our science programs is the science of video games, where we have uh, an ABD in mathematics who's actually getting pretty technical with how video games function. We also have a science class on optimizing uh, human performance, where we get into not only standard you know, nutrition and fitness and so forth, but also things like the gut biome and uh, peak performance you know, physiology and getting students to really think about how they can become their best selves. And that's very different from a traditional high school biology course. We go into a little bit of uh, geeking out on the quantified self. To go into our PE course, PE is usually thought of as one of the most boring and uh, frankly stupid courses out there. In our case, we do have this uh, CrossFit expert I mentioned who's teaching a PE course where using quantified self metrics, Fitbits and whatnot, he helps the students set up individualized goals. So again, it's individualized, uh, but based on individualized fitness goals and then monitoring those through uh, various quantified uh, digital metrics. I think that's really exciting and fun. Um, we have a tech uh, course, technology course, that's actually taught by a young tech entrepreneur who is doing um, startup weekends when he was you know, 9, 10, 11, and was starting companies at the age of 12, 13, 14. And now at the ripe old age of 17, he's still starting companies and he's teaching kids technology and he knows way more than anybody else in the, in the school. Um, we have an art teacher and the art teacher is himself uh, a professional creative who is writing a graphic novel working to get that published. It's very well done and sophisticated. And he is training our students to become excellent at art with a goal towards how do I develop professional level skills. Um, and so again, you're seeing a common theme that while we have all these cool electives, our ideal, especially on the you know, skill development side, is to have people who have practiced in the real world and frankly, I prefer to have young practitioners. One of the reasons for that, by the way, is um, teens are programmed to respect other teens. They're programmed, peer pressure can be used negatively. We want to use peer pressure positively. And I've had a lot of you know, guest speakers who are entrepreneurs. And I, I know that when I have a group of 15 to 18 year olds and I bring a 22 year old entrepreneur, 
their eyes light up in a way they don't if I bring in a 50-year-old year old entrepreneur. So all due respect to those of us who are over 50, um, mm -hmm. you're much, much cooler if you're under 25 and the kids listen in a fundamentally different way. And so we use that dynamic of aspiring to be like the coolest and best young people uh, in the fields of interest that our students have. Um, just while I'm on this point, because it's relatively unusual, I'm friends with the founders of the Teal Fellowship. Peter Teal famously gives 20 students under 20, $100,000 each year to drop out of school and start a business. Um, the Teal Fellows include um, the founder, Vitalik Buterin, the founder of Ethereum. So that's a mega successful Teal Fellow. It also includes uh, Austin Russell, who started his company at 17, now at 26, is the world's youngest billionaire. Uh, it provides LIDAR technology. So the Teal Fellows, and it's funny, Larry Summers said it was the most misguided piece of philanthropy 10 years ago. It's created rock stars. Um, so I am very familiar with the Teal Fellowship, its founders, how it works. If I have a student who's a candidate for that, happy to plug them into that. The founders of the Teal Fellowship, by the way, went on to create the 1517 Fund, which is a venture capital fund focused on teen, early 20 entrepreneurs and how to help them crank up their businesses. There's heavy mentoring involved in that. And so if you have a child who has the potential to be a very serious entrepreneur, um, we can plug in, them into the very highest world-class networks, including raising capital for their companies. That's amazing. That's unbelievable. So a couple of times throughout today's presentation, you've mentioned mentorship. I think that it's worthwhile to spend a few minutes and talk about our experiences with young mentees, what it means, how, how we, we go about um, providing this, and the opportunities that this opens up for a lot of the kids. Do you want to start? And then I do have some, some insights from my side that I would like to put in as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. What would it kind of be? Even back up in our admissions process, one of our first questions to a child is, what do you love? What do you care about? And that right there is unusual. Most schools have a program. They push the kid through the program, uh, and the kid either fits or doesn't fit. We're focused on the child and their interests from day one. And we use kind of the frame of, uh, there's something called the purpose diagram, sometimes called the Ikigai diagram. That's the intersection of what do you love, what are you good at, what does the world need and what can you get paid for? And I see that diagram as kind of a guide star for the mentorship because of course, if a student loves something, it's easier, but they should also be good at it. And some students are unrealistic about what they're good at. Sometimes they overestimate how good they are. Sometimes they underestimate it. I'd say boys tend to overestimate how good they are. And sometimes girls tend to underestimate how good they are. But we want to help them develop a realistic sense of what they're good at and then how to get better at it. And you know what the world needs, I think many young people do want to do something meaningful. And so they, you know, whatever their values are, we want them to kind of think about living a life aligned with their values, because they think all of us are more energized and motivated. You know, entrepreneurship is hard. Uh, as an adult, we all know it got lots of challenges, failures. It's better if they're deeply committed. And then finally, what can you make money at? We unabashedly believe in creating value and being compensated for that. And great entrepreneurs often become very wealthy because they create great value for large numbers of people. So that kind of purpose diagram is fundamental to mentorship. And then when we get one-on-one -on -one with students, starting with what do they love, then we kind of add, and what are you good at? What does the world need? And how can you get paid for it? This is not in a 20-minute conversation or a 30-minute once a week, you don't land any of these. Often it's a long process to get the students to really think through um, who they are, what they care about, what's meaningful to them, and how realistically they could cash this out into an entrepreneurial career broadly construed. Um, so I'll pause there, Mikel, and kind of let you dive in a little bit, and then I'll bounce off you. Sure, absolutely. So I've started working with a with a young uh, mentee recently, and I was very surprised when I started working with him. This is a really good kid. He's 17 years old, and I think that he had a little bit of trouble before he entered our school, to be honest. I think that he had problems with his family and probably with a lot of motivation. I don't think he was doing very well in his local school. And he came to us, or his, his mother came to us more, more appropriately and, and spoke with Michael and I, and, and we decided to accept him into the program. 
And I was talking to him ooh, about two or three weeks ago and, you know, after his first month there, you know, how, how is it going? How are you finding things? Are you making friends? You know, all of these types of things. And the response was more than I could have hoped for. First of all, I mean, he was really excited about the program. Now that I had had conversations with the mother before and she said, you know, he's not really getting excited about things. He doesn't, he wants to make money, but he doesn't really, you know, what to do or how to go about it or anything like that. And, you know, he looked at the school and it was like, he really understood that he had to motivate himself for these types of things. He said, you know, on one of the first projects that I had to do or, or assignments that I had to hand in, they asked me to do it. I agreed to it. Then they said, we set a date together and I didn't do it. And no one was behind me to like push me or nag me or bug me about it. And a day went by and no one bugged me. And then a, three days went by and no one bugged me. And then I started to feel bad. And then I went and did it because everyone else was doing it. And because I was actually a pretty cool project and I wanted to do it. And now I'm doing it. And then he did the next one on time and he started to gather this self-motivation. So we talked through all of these types of things in one of our, our sessions. Um, in another one of the sessions, we talked about his part-time job. He's working at a pizza place and he wasn't sure, you know, he wants to make money and he's earning good money at it um, for a 17 year old but wasn't sure if this was a good idea to continue with. So we started list listing and looking at all the different skills that he's building up. So at the pizza place, he needs to learn how to do arithmetic on the fly by giving change. He needs to vary his sales technique every time he's going to do an upgrade for someone's meal. He has to vary his pitch, cadence, tonality, uh, speed, everything like this when he's speaking with people. He now is able to judge people's reaction on what he can go for when he's trying to sell things. So he's learning sales at a pizza place at 16, 17 years old, where most kids are not doing anything. He actually became the, the youngest supervisor at his pizza place um, at 17 years old and has the keys and now closes down the restaurant five nights a week. And they entrust him with that. So he's learning personal responsibility. So these were skills that he's starting to learn through his job that he didn't even realize that he's learning. But during our conversations, we can highlight those things. Now, that's not an entrepreneurial venture by any means, but those are skills that are needed in any type of entrepreneurial venture. So by opening up doors for him and, and showing him different opportunities, he's going to be better prepared to go through them. I mean, he's not out there making a million dollars as a 17-year-old entrepreneur yet, but I think with the proper guidance, this kid can really go far. He has the work ethic. He's extraordinarily smart. He's personable. He's well-spoken. And I think with some right guidance and mentorship, he can really accomplish a lot. And it's more than just, I, I, I don't want to come across as just, it's only about making money or it's only about these types of things. I mean, the... The look on his face and the engagement and how he's actually interacting is amazing to watch. The kid is happy. That is one of the most important things in the world. Michael, why don't you tell us some of the experiences you've had with your mentees? You've worked with lots of mentees over the years, and I'd love to hear some, some uh, situations that you went through with them. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and first, you know, when I think of some of my most entrepreneurial students, um, first, I have one who's now in college studying business, but he uh, was able to buy his own car uh, at 16, and by the time he was 18, had bought two other cars. So by means strictly of his businesses, his mom didn't give him a dime, though his mom was an entrepreneur, so he was also learning it at home. Uh, he had both web design and SEO businesses, and he was able to make enough money to buy himself several cars in high school. Uh, and now he's looking at much bigger uh, ambitions. But one interesting thing about him is he had been in both public and private schools prior to coming to my school, and he was regarded as a very significant behavioral problem at those schools. Um, so, and I think even had a technical diagnosis as, um, you know, obstinate, uh, obstinate, I forget the word, but obstinate disorder, basically, <laughs> hard to get along with. And he thrived in our program, primarily because, again, he didn't want to be told what to do. He wanted to take initiative. And as a consequence, he made real money as a teenager, and I expect he'll go on and create a substantial company as he gets older. Um, 
And he loved our program, by the way. He loved being recognized and supported in his entrepreneurial initiative. I've got another one um, with whom I'm just beginning to mentor, but I've known him since he was younger. And he was an incredible behavior problem uh, when he was younger and still is. You know, he's the kind of kid who gets kicked out of school all the time and he'll be a rock star for us. Uh, right now, he's making thousands of dollars on a weekend selling uh, items in game on game gaming platforms. He's figured out basically to arbitrage uh, different sorts of things in gaming platforms and make money, which is fabulous. But he had not yet thought about creating a real company. You know, arbitrage is entirely legitimate. And yet I think something I often see is the kids who are most entrepreneurial, who maybe have an appetite for making money, uh, have never been mentored to create something substantial. And again, I see these kids as ready when they're young to begin building something. And even if their first company fails after two or three years or doesn't achieve its goals, once you actually start moving towards building something, it's a fundamentally different attitude. You set longer term goals. You learn how to think about planning in a different way. You're not just looking at how can I you know, make as much money this weekend as possible, but what do I need to do now to make this company succeed two, three, four, five years from now? And so I believe I'm providing tremendous value by mentoring these students, opening their eyes. It's really exciting because you see these kids who had never thought big in this way. And the school system does not encourage them to think big. And in fact, it says they're behavior problems. So um, I would say one of the most joyful aspects of what I do is finding uh, these kids who have never been supported in developing big picture entrepreneurial dreams and being coached on how to get to those entrepreneurial dreams. Almost every weekly conversation is sort of opening up a new facet that they had never thought of before. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm working with this young man. Okay, yep, you're, you can, you're an entrepreneur. Yep, you can make money. Now, what might it look like to create a real company and build something? Eyes light up. Can't wait for the next conversation every week. That's amazing. That's amazing. Well, I would like to get into some Q&A. Why don't we start putting some questions in the chat? I'm going to look back through here and see if there is anything in here so far let's see jim how are you good to see you here tonight uh danielle says failure equals feedback you are absolutely correct um bob says he has five children 10 grandchildren three master's degrees and did his doctorate work at gwu and been in 35 countries my goodness lots of experience 23 different countries, companies in 23 different countries and a group of 50 people. Amazing. Happy to have you here tonight, Bob. And his goal is to totally revise the American education system. Yes, us too, I think. <laughs> Lofty goal, but uh, we're working hard at it as well. Okay. Bob, well, Michael's reading that, Bob. I, happy to have one-on-one -on -one conversations with anybody. Type my email, but... Bob, if we want to go deeply into this, I, I certainly have a lot of relevant experience. Happy to address uh, any aspect of it with you. So my email address is michael at socraticexperience.com. Uh, happy to talk big picture entrepreneurship, entrepreneurial education, and also happy to talk to anybody who whose child might be a good fit for our program. Absolutely. Okay, let's get some questions going. I see. Bob is typing, Jim is typing, Samuel is typing. Okay, I've got some lofty goals too, but lots of little steps. Need to take care of details first, pay the bills and all of that. I understand, Samuel. I understand completely. While we're waiting for questions to come in, Michael, why don't we talk about some of the other reasons that our school is so very different than traditional education? Absolutely. Actually, um, you know, Alex is helping us out there. Maybe Alex, you could post the when school's not working site. One theme that I've touched on parenthetically, but I think we cannot exaggerate the importance of it, is the extent to which for some people, and feel free to drop your personal experience into this, Mikel, and we've covered it, but for some people, school is actively harmful. 
And that may sound like an audacious claim, but let me give you a little bit of data. Um, Gallup, Gallup organization polls students and finds that while maybe 60% are engaged in elementary school, by the time they get into high school, two thirds are disengaged. And I believe being disengaged is fundamentally unhealthy for any human being for six hours a day, four years of your life, or if it starts in middle school, six hours a day, seven years of your life to be disengaged. Um, Yale did a study a couple of years ago, 75% of high school students are unhappy at school. I don't know of any other market where 75% of the customers are dissatisfied. So just as a you know business opportunity, I look at, hey, we've got 75% of the market is unhappy. Let's go after those miserable <laughs> kids. To speak a little bit with a little bit more um, sobriety and gravity, uh, the CDC, Center for Disease Control, shows that the two primary factors with respect to adolescent well-being are um, connection with parents and connection at school. And if students don't feel connected at school, they are much more likely to suffer anxiety, depression, suicide, substance abuse, uh, teen pregnancy, you know, accidents, drunk driving. And so this is actually, I see it as a public health crisis for me personally, the misery and disengagement of a significant percentage of our population of young people is one of the most severe public health crises we have. And so I believe that if we can create educational opportunities where students are happy, motivated, engaged, uh, that is going to help millions of children, and I'm all about scale, millions of children have happier, better lives while also actually have a more positive impact in the world. Um, and maybe a pause there, Mikhail, and you can give a, a brief version of your experience in schooling as a case study and uh, how it can sure. be done. Well, I think most people probably know my school, my schooling background. Basically, in a nutshell, I stopped going to school when I was 12 and I dropped out officially when I was 15. I was I was diagnosed as a dyslexic as a child and I was I was pulled out of my neighborhood school and sent across town. And um, I went to a really horrible I went through a really horrible experience with it. I absolutely hated my time there. Um, I used to come home from school literally in tears every single day. I got in fights. I still have a broken nose today. I was in Colombia a couple of weeks ago speaking to some people about medical tourism to go over there and get my nose fixed at almost 40 years old from things that happened when I was a child. Um, you know, I think it is one of the main motivators that pushed me or, or drove me to want to create this school with you, Michael, because my experience was so brutal. I'm like, I don't want that. I don't want anyone else to go through that. Now, I, I have two children myself. I, I'm very fortunate. I'm a father. Uh, my daughter is five years old. I have a brand new baby boy. He's seven months old at the moment. And um, this is the first school that I would ever actually consider sending my children to. Actually, I went out there and built the school that I wanted, that I thought is, is ideal and is the best solution. I mean, even though I'm a dyslexic and I you know, have this quote unquote learning disability. I never lost my, my passion for education or my passion for learning. Um, I actually studied how to learn for many years, um, how to process ideas, how to develop ideas, all of these types of things. Um, and I've put a lot of that type of thing into the school in, into the marketing of it, into the branding of it and this, um, I think that the school is, honestly, it's very special. I think that it really is. I think that what we're building here is something that people should take notice of, that um, is a viable solution for others. I mean, in, in this instance, we're talking about kids who have problems uh, with traditional education, but even if your child doesn't have problems with traditional education, it's just not a friendly environment. It's not a good environment to go through as a child. Um, I still remember vividly what it was like, and I've talked to many parents since and talked to many subscribers since, and they also had terrible experiences. I don't think that a lot of people realize how bad it is, or maybe they have short memories and they forget, or 
they don't know that there's alternatives out there, that something like this is actually um, available. That's why with the invitation for this, I said, you know, if you are a parent or a grandparent, or if you just want to get involved and help out and spread the word, then come join us for this call. And I know that a couple of people on this call tonight don't have school age kids, but are, are here because they want to help spread the message. So that's the type of thing that we're building here. We're building something really strong with a community that has a real purpose behind it because a lot of the kids really do need help. Okay, I want to read some of these questions. Sorry, I get a little bit, uh, how to say, not sad, but a little bit worked up when I think about some of the things that happen and, and dig up some of the, the emotions from, from back when I was in school. Samuel asks, what does a good candidate for your school look like? And I'll dig into that one, Mikhail, while you're reading the comments. So Perfect. Samuel, um, and I'll read the rest of it. My kid teaches himself. If it weren't the need for certification later on, I'd be happy to just let him keep doing what he naturally does. So first, I see the best candidates for our school are kids who are entrepreneurial, creative, intellectual, curious, um, who want meaningful, me, want school to be meaningful. I would say, and many of those students, by the way, hate existing schools, or some of them are just blah. They're not, they're not thriving and excited. Um, conversely, the students who perhaps are not excited about uh, our program are students who like the system of jumping through hoops. And so if a student actively likes the conventional system, they might not be a, a good candidate. So if your school, if your student just loves regular school, uh, you know, maybe you should leave them where they are. But if they're in any sense dissatisfied, if you have the, any inclination that your child is not thriving, brilliant, motivated, excited, happy, then we should definitely talk. Um, and Samuel, just to address your issue on certification, first, uh, I would say I'm an expert at getting students through or into whatever institution they want with or without certification. Lots of nuances on that. But to give you one example, when school's not working that Alex posted earlier is a set of interviews with alternative educators, but even mostly alternative uh, students or parents who went through alternative pathways. One of the examples there, Mikkel's interviewed there, but another one is a Laura Deming's father, John Deming. Laura Deming, give you a brief version of her story. At the Her dad, John Deming, good friend of mine, he's an entrepreneur. And at the age of six, she asked her dad, should I go to school? And he said, well, you can if you want to, but I wouldn't. And so trusting her dad, she decided to stay home. She stayed home and basically did math, read books, um, played the piano and had long walks and chats with her dad. No conventional schooling at all. No formal classes at home or otherwise. Uh, she did have the discipline to do math every day, which is unusual. But by the time she was 12, she wrote to a researcher in at the UC San Francisco wanting to intern with her. And she managed to, at the age of 12, intern in a lab with world famous anti-aging researcher. Again, without ever taking conventional courses, but at this point she was auditing college math and science courses. At the age of 14, she got into MIT. I saw the transcript she used. Um, she and her father basically had a, a simple transcript kind of an informal Word document that listed the math science courses she had audited and the uh, books she had read. And then with references from this world-class researcher, she got into MIT. I just had a student get into Harvard, who was one of my, he was an intern for me. Um, and he had no traditional education at all, had taken college courses, uh, community college courses in this case, but by the way, had been a professional actor as a teenager. And that helped him get into Harvard. And so basically, especially the good liberal arts colleges, they want amazing kids. They don't care what boxes you've checked. Uh, if you are an amazing kid, that's what they really want. So, you know, there are also, you know, different nuances. Some state schools are much more, you know, bureaucratic and check the boxes. Uh, but Samuel, if you were anybody else, I'd be happy to talk one on one on how to help you get into a school. Um, going back a little bit, why a kid who learns on his own might want to join our school uh, is that many of them, no matter how bright and self-motivated they are, really love to be in a community of other bright, self-motivated kids. So 
it might be great for him right now learning on his own, but how much more enjoyable to be um, in a social environment like the one we create. And as a consequence, we've had students who visit one day, we encourage shadow days, so they come and visit for a day, and they wanna enroll the very next day because this is their home, this is their people. Um, so yeah, let's, let's talk, Samuel. Uh, Alex, sorry, Alex is our moderator tonight. He is helping us out. If you can put in the chat box the link for scheduling a call, it's going to take you to a calendar page. And on that calendar page, uh, you could be able to select a date and a time if you guys want to get a hold of us and talk. We're happy to sit down with you and discuss your kids and the future and how this looks. Jim had a interesting point as well, or, or an interesting comment. Um, I'm not going to read the first point here, Jim, but he says that my only concern would be how your school would give children an education that would make university level quantitative course work, engineering, physics, science, etc. Now you you talked about this a little bit, Michael, but maybe it's worth talking a little bit more about the opportunities for kids who do want to go on to uh, education and possibly STEM type of programs? Absolutely. No, it's a really important point. So thanks for bringing it up. First, I would say, um, I'm going to talk to our demographic because it depends on the demographic. But I would say about 20% of our students are, I'll call them math rock stars, where one of the reasons they're coming to us is they chew through mathematics way more quickly than regular schools support or allow. And we're so flexible and personalized, we can support students who are math rock stars. Um, conversely, maybe another 20% of our students are more or less um, you know, where other students are grade level wise mathematics. And then we do attract a lot of people who maybe struggle with mathematics. And because we have such a range of abilities um, and aptitudes and attitudes, we customize. So to talk about our mathematics curriculum in particular, and you know, we're gonna add science onto that, but first, math is key. Um, first of all, personally, I was someone who loved mathematics in school and wished that I could have gone much faster. Um, then later I became interested in philosophy and didn't have the focus on math I had earlier. So I am really supportive of, if you love math, let's crank it. Um, so we have two components in our math program. One component is the linear curriculum. We use MathSpace, which is adaptive self-paced math software. We have students set goals in MathSpace every year. And typically the default expectation is that they are going to achieve standard one year of mathematics, one year of math progress. So in high school, that's algebra one, geometry, algebra two, pre-calc, calc. But because goals are individualized, we also have and encourage motivated students to do more than a year of math. Um, so we've had students do a year and a half of math, two years of math. In one case, I had a student set and achieve goals of covering four years of mathematics in one year. And of course, if you have a motivated uh, student who, say, gets through calculus by 10th grade and can go on to do AP stats, AP computer science, and maybe you know, multivariate calculus before they leave high school, they're going to be way ahead of the game. In addition to the linear math curriculum, we also emphasize problem solving from a young age. And one of the reasons is the standard linear math curriculum, I think, doesn't do a good job of training students in how to solve complex problems. I have been greatly influenced by Georg Polya, how to solve it. He's a famous Hungarian mathematician who focused on problem solving as an art. And we use something called CSMP uh, for part of that. We also use Brilliant.org. Brilliant.org is a wonderful resource for interesting problems. We've also used math competition problem sets. Um, but instead of expecting the students to solve those on their own, often math competition problems don't require higher levels of mathematics, but they require a real insight into a mathematical situation. It's sort of like a brain teaser. And so our students will think, talk, and argue about how do you crack this nut? How do you figure out this problem? The idea is to develop a much, much broader repertoire of problem solving capacities. So between um, self-paced mathematics, which can include radically accelerated mathematics, along with the you know, math problem solving, which can include math competition problem sets, um, then if a student is very mathematically motivated, we can also coach them for math competitions and or help them in specialized STEM research. Um, we do offer, for instance, a Java course, and a student who's motivated can not only earn Java, but uh, 
go well beyond if they want. Um, one of the things I didn't mention when I was talking about diverse high school options is the world of MOOCs. There are thousands of online courses. I've had several students take Harvard CS50, the introduction to computer science at Harvard, and um, from there go on and learn to code and become software developers, and in some cases major in computer science. So for students who are interested in STEM, we can definitely help them rock it. Wonderful. Okay, let's see what we all, what we have in the chat here. Uh, Danielle says, "Wish I could travel back in time and send my kids to your school. I homeschooled mine. I'm a big proponent for homeschooling as well, Danielle. Um, when I first started talking with Michael, he said to me that uh, you can kind of think of this program as as unschooling or or homeschooling by professionals." And I thought, wow, that's amazing. That's such a great way to think about it and to look at it. You know, we took the best of the homeschooling movement and and brought it to our school. But I understand coming from a homeschooling background, um, which I think is a really excellent opportunity. Uh, Daniel also says, I would like to get involved. We would be happy to have you. Anything um, that you would be able to help with, you know, we're 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 taking on mentors we're taking on professionals who have specific specific skills that they want to contribute people who have audiences and want to share the message if they have uh, social media followings getting the word out there's lots of ways that you can get involved um, we're going to even start to have uh, some guest speakers that will come on to talk about their lives if they've been businesses and things like that actually on that note that's actually something that i do want to discuss from the uh, from the entrepreneurial side and, and i've kind of hinted at it before but what my plan is is i actually want to take my podcast and i want to do it live in front of the kids so we're going to start it very very small we're going to have it with a chat box and the kids will be able to watch live and ask questions and then eventually as we build up and we figure this out i would like to start bringing the kids on for the last say 5 10 15 minutes and they ask the questions of our guest who is presenting that day. So for example, let's say we have a guest on and he's built a, I, I had a guest on who built a water bottle company and they started doing over a billion dollars in sales every year in water bottles. Um, you know, how, ama how amazing would it be if your child had an opportunity to ask questions directly to the founder and CEO, he's, he's been set, sold the um, company, who had built this, you know, uh, the logistics that he had to do for getting manufacturing done in China, having it brought over to the United States, the sales, the marketing, all of these different pieces. And your child would actually be able to ask the questions live on a call as I'm interviewing. And I've had so many amazing people. We've done, I think we've recorded 174 episodes of the podcast. I think 167, 168 of them are live at the moment. We have the, the next couple weeks are all planned out. But think back to all of the guests. If you guys have heard my program, how amazing it would have been for your child to be able to meet these people and speak to them and ask them questions and things like that. So those are all things that we're getting people involved. We're going to be getting my guests involved. We're getting parents involved. We're getting um, people to come in and do presentations. There's lots, lots, lots going on. All right. Let's see. Um... Jim says, the school seems to be a great opportunity for a child. I would agree. Thank you so much, Jim. Samuel said, I would love to help teach with your school. Mostly I teach English as a second language, but I've got a wide background with a lot of experience in writing. Amazing. You should schedule a call and we'll discuss things, Samuel. Um, Mimi says, Spanish speaking is on par, Samuel. Okay. Uh, Paul says, certainly will be interested in your school as my boy gets older. Planning on homeschooling on the family farm in Vietnam. Very nice. Uh, had been an ESL, English as a second language teacher in Vietnam a few years ago. What an amazing experience, Paul. That's fantastic. Well, let's see if we can get some more questions in here, guys. We're going to go for as long as you want. I don't have any more meetings after this. This is my last call after being interviewed, I think, twice today and uh, and many, many calls. So I'm here to answer as many questions as you guys have. Put them in the chat box for us, okay? Um, Samuel says, their main issue is don't have a lot of disposable income, but I've got a smart kid and I'd like to get him 
uh, local certification so that the authorities don't bother us for not educating our son. He definitely needs Spanish and more social contact. Yes, um, as an expat, a lot of countries don't uh, know and understand homeschooling, which is a real shame. Uh, we offer a accredited and non-accredited program. So I would argue that our school would qualify, that you would need to you would need to be able to discuss it if if they ever did come and start asking questions, which I don't actually see very often. There, there's there's a big difference between the laws and the implementation of laws, or the the um, them pushing the laws on you. But um, within our program, uh, we do have an accredited and a non-accredited, so I think that would qualify. As for the issues of disposable income, we do have opportunities for financial aid on very specific situations, but that is something that we might be able to discuss with you. Um, Danielle asks, how many kids do you have in your school? How many languages? Michael, how many kids do we have enrolled at the moment? We are about 90 for second semester, we'll probably be over 100. Um, and by next fall, probably several hundred. Amazing. Uh, for languages, we have kids from all over the world. Uh, we have a young girl from Pakistan. We have a family in Oman. We have many families here in Panama, where I am tonight. We have families in Costa Rica. So a lot of the kids speak English, which is what we are offering the program in but they will also speak another language. So they might have a first language. English is the second language. We are also offering uh, our courses, or we're going to be offering, I should say, um, secondary languages for the kids. So if you actually move overseas as an expat and you're, say, in a Latin American country and the child doesn't speak Spanish, it's a great opportunity for them to learn Spanish in our program. We've actually haven't done an official release, but... Um, we are going to be partnering with my really dear friend, Ollie Richards. He runs uh, Story Learning, which if you guys have been on my newsletter, you've probably heard me talk about about a thousand times because I'm a huge fan of his. I actually used his system to get quite fluent myself in Spanish when I moved down to Panama, and I'm a big fan of his work. He's been on my podcast. I've been on his conferences. He's been on mine, and we're going to find ways that we're going to incorporate his, his style of teaching and his programs into ours. So for the languages, there's lots of opportunities. Eventually, down the line, Michael and I have discussed about offering our core programs, not just in English, but also in Spanish. And then we'll see after that. But um, lots in the works for the school as we grow, you know, uh, semester by semester, year by year uh, opportunities there. Uh, Mimi's, oh, Jim says, Mimi, great suggestion for teaching a child in a foreign language. Uh, I did the all pair strategy with my children. They are both fluent in Spanish as adults, but Jim, how's their Portuguese? How's their Portuguese? I'm Jim always likes to make fun of me about my Portuguese accent. Whenever I do my videos, I was in Brazil for six months and I was having a heckler every time. Jim, I love you. You're great. <laughs> well, it's lagging. Okay, not a problem. Um, any other questions that you guys want to ask? Questions about the program? Uh, questions about entrepreneurship for kids? Questions about the structure of the program? How things are set up? The history? The, the outline? The time zones? Lots of different um, logistical things that we could get into. <laughs> so just um, somebody asks, I believe it's Jim, what is the school's status in um, Brazil, Colombia, and Uruguay? So uh, perhaps, Mikkel, you can answer this, but it's the high school program is accredited in the state of Maine. And so they would be enrolled in a U.S. Um, accredited high school program. We are also offering uh, accredited college courses. And so those transfer to universities. They're completely, you know, mainstream accredited college courses. So as long as accredited high school and college courses are legitimate in your country, that's not a problem. Uh, for younger or unaccredited students, we'd have to check in on how this works out. Uh, again, Mikkel, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, you know, I, I was speaking with the lawyers literally this week in Uruguay talking about Uruguay's a, a country that I'm going to be offering to a lot of my private clients going forwards. So I've been speaking to a law firm 
for hours and hours and hours about the residency program, immigration, um, COVID mandates, uh, taxes, business, corporations, everything like that. And one of the things that we did discuss was the possibility for homeschooling, which is not looked upon favorably in Uruguay at all. They, they don't like homeschooling. The laws are actually that you need to send your child to a local school, an in-person school. Now, as things have changed because of COVID, they've made a lot of allowances for this um, over the last two years. But now things are really opening up there. So we're going to see how it unfolds. Now, there are also opportunities to to prepare a letter and and have it certified that the child is enrolled in a program and we have we can get special permission for this. This is all being tested. It is all being talked about. It's currently in the works right now. Um, also, with a country like Uruguay, when you're going through the residency, if you have a child, you need to enroll the child in the schooling. But what ends up happening is it's um, it's when you actually do your residency. So you're not having people who are knocking on your door and following up afterwards. It's just the immigration department. So you can actually register for the local school, which is free, which is included um, uh, when you live there, when you get your residency. And then afterwards, take your child out of the program. Um, you already have your permanent residency and they're not following up. That was the, uh, the kind of unofficial advice um, while I was doing my research on this. And Danielle asks, is it just K-12? We're also taking older kids. So we've had a number of kind of 19-year-olds, kind of post-high school. So far, we haven't had students much older than that. Uh, but certainly because what we offer is very unique, and especially insofar as our offering helps students to own their own education and focus and learn entrepreneurial skills, um, it is entirely appropriate for a post-high school year. You know, if you have a much older student, we could talk about a special offering, but typically um, beyond, say, the 13th year, 19-year-old, uh, we haven't had students of that age. Going down to younger age ages, we recommend our program for students ages 8 and up. Occasionally, a mature 7-year-old works out, simply because being online, for the younger children, the program is online and then do activities, and it's designed so they're not staring at a screen for six hours. But younger than seven, it, it doesn't really feel quite appropriate. Um, that said, um, you know, Samuel's asking for a five-year-old. We're beginning to put together recommended resources for younger children. So say if you're homeschooling, you can do things that are aligned. I also have a list of logic games that I think are really great for children. And we can send you our recommendations on logic games. I also actually have, you know, Socratic Dialogue's my thing. I have a channel called Socratic Michael Strong at YouTube where I started engaging in Socratic dialogue with um, Alana, age four, and now she's nine. And so you can see five years of Socratic dialogues with a child between the ages of four and nine. Now she's in a group of four or five kids, uh, depends on the weekend. So happy to you know model Socratic dialogue with younger children. Um, and so I would say for younger children, kind of high level sort of overview advice combined with specific recommendations such as logic games, combined with modeling Socratic dialogue, and gradually we'll uh, make this into more of a digestible package. I asked literally the exact same question of Michael uh, probably about six months ago because my daughter is five years old and wanted to know, okay, where... You know, we're homeschooling her until she's of age that she'll be joining expat international school. Um, you know, what should I be working on with her? You know, I want to make sure that she has a background in math and she understands these things. And Michael gave me a huge list of different logic games. We went on Amazon. We started picking up different ones and finding even more. There's so many amazing tools out there for educational products at the moment and started working with her on those. And she absolutely loves them. She's um really enjoys it because it's done in a way where we don't model it as work or you know a pain we we model it as fun time and daddy daughter time and she just gets a kick out of all of this jim says my wife and i will be pre prepping and sponsoring students where we have business for attending your school that's amazing we plan on making sure that they speak English to a sufficient level and have been sponsoring them in a way that is an activity for a few years already. Thanks for the info. That's amazing, Jim. Thank you so much. We would be happy to discuss this with you, how we can support you and how we can bring the kids that you're working with, with into the program. That would be fantastic. 
You also mentioned something there about um, getting English to an appropriate level. Maybe, Michael, you can speak about some of our other students who have come in with English as a second language and maybe not to the degree that someone would necessarily think that was necessary and maybe the transformation that's happened in such a short time frame. Absolutely. So first of all, as many people over the you know centuries have no noticed, children are language sponges and they learn most powerfully from peers. Actually, a core principle of our school is uh, you, we all learn most powerfully from peers, but children in particular learn most powerfully from peers. And so the fact that most of our day consists of peer-to-peer -peer dialogue, you know, led by a guide, but they're listening to students talk with each other and they're really eager to know what everybody's saying and why everybody else is reacting the way they are. So that kind of peer motivation, you know, on the one hand can be used to get them to read texts more deeply, listen to long, complex arguments, but also English. And so we've had a number of students with fairly modest um, backgrounds in English who quickly developed fluency because it is an immersion program in English dialogue. Um, there are some students where their English is, you know, more uh, basic and there, you know, we're recommending additional English language resources, but the immersion in English dialogue accelerates their development, even if they mean, may need a little bit of kind of an additional jumpstart. So I think most students um, find this to be, you know, the peer immersion in dialogue to be one of the most motivating ways to develop high level English skills they could possibly have in, happen. And if they do need supplemental uh, English language support, they'll be more motivated to study the basic grammar and vocabulary they need so that they can listen and participate with their peers. Fantastic. Okay, we are coming up on time, everyone. Let's get the last question or two in the chat box, and then we will wrap up for the night. If I missed your question, just drop something in there as well. I think we got to all of the ones before, but if I missed one, then I apologize. I'm just reading through the sidebar here. While you're doing so, Mikhail, I just want to make make one connection explicit. When I talk about with younger children, on the one hand, Socratic dialogue, and on the other hand, logic games. For me, one of the key abilities to develop at any age, but it's especially great to develop when children are young, is the ability for a child to focus their attention on long sequences of logical statements. And you know, if somebody is say a coder. You'd imagine uh, if you can think through long sequences of if then, if then, that's great. I was a chess player, and a lot of chess is thinking through different op options in terms of if, this, then. And if you can see, say, two, three, four, or five moves in advance, five would be a lot. But uh, by means of following sequences of logical inferences, it's a superpower. Um, when I talk about Socratic dialogue, one of the things that I try to do is to develop a child's ability to maintain a focus on a logical argument. When they're four years old, as Alana was when I began with her, if she could focus for maybe five minutes on a logical argument, that was extraordinary. Now we could easily go 20 minutes, we could probably go 45 minutes or an hour, and she's only nine. Um, so the ability to focus on long sequences of logical inferences is a superpower that I believe in developing to as high a level um, as early as possible and maintain for an extended, you know, basically throughout their education. Fantastic. Well, I looked through the questions that looked like we answered everything and no other questions have come in. So thank you everybody for joining us here tonight. I really appreciate your time. Um, if you guys wanna find out more about the school, you guys can go to expatschool.io expatschool.io. You're going to find a button up in the top right hand corner where you can schedule a call with Michael and I. Um, there's more information about the program, how things work, the different program, the different classes that we do, um, the timings, et cetera, et cetera. There's lots on there for you to read. So go take a look. It's at expatschool.io. And I hope that you guys enjoyed today's presentation. Um, Thank you so much, Michael, for your time. And I will talk to everybody very, very soon. Danielle says, thank you. It was very inspiring. Jim says, thanks for all the info. The school is what I wish I had for my children. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mikhail. Thanks, everybody. 
and feel free to re reach out. I'm super passionate. I live and breathe this kind of stuff. So <laughs> look forward to talking to any of you in whatever capacity works out. Thanks so much. All right. Bye-bye.